How do you persuade someone to stop bombing civilian areas, not to recruit children as soldiers, or that they shouldn't raid villages to pillage the only food supply? There has never been a greater need for effective advocacy for the protection of civilians in conflict and crisis. But how do we do this protection advocacy? What skills and techniques can we use? How can we identify decision makers? What tactics work? And how can we manage risks? Welcome to the Advocating for Protection podcast, where we bring you the real experiences of advocates in conflict and crisis. In each episode, you'll hear from those who are lobbying in the corridors of the UN buildings in New York, those who are face to face with armed actors at the front line of conflict zones and everything in between. They will tell us about their personal experiences, their successes, but also the challenges and how they overcame them. This podcast comes to you from the Global Protection Clusters Advocacy Working Group. Please be aware that it contains discussions of violence, abuse and exploitation faced by civilians in conflict and crisis. Hello and welcome to Advocating for a Protection podcast. My name is Matt Byrne. I'm a senior protection advisor with the ProCap project. And today we're especially excited to have Thayer, the operations manager for Asia and the Middle East North Africa region at the CCHN, which is the Center of Competence for Humanitarian Negotiation, and Major Stuart Thomas. He's a commander of Canada's high readiness civil military cooperation capability. So the topic of today's podcast is really the process and the steps that both Thayer and uh, Major Stuart Thomas go through from their different perspectives before approaching a stakeholder. So that person or organization that is in a position to make a change that we want to see to protect people better. And we'll get two differing, and I would also suggest complementary perspectives from uh, Major Stewart or Stu. Can I call you Stu? Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Stu and Thayer, as we go throughout the podcast today. So with that, I think I'll start with you, uh, Stu. And could you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to be in the position you are today and what motivates you? Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for being here. It's, uh, it's a real privilege. Um, yeah, so joined the Canadian Army when I was just 17, uh, uh, part time, uh, mostly because I wanted a job that would keep me away from a desk, which has turned ironic over time, uh, as I find myself increasingly sitting behind one. Uh, but over the course of my career, I've been very lucky. I've deployed three times uh, or four times now operationally, and each time my orders have been uh, to help whatever country uh, I've been going to. So I consider myself very fortunate on that front. Uh, I started off as an infantry officer and technically still am, but I've become very specialized in, in what Canada and most uh, Western countries call uh, CIMIC or civil military cooperation, which is really the military's focal point for uh, engaging with the civil societies, uh, humanitarians uh, and government agencies uh, that exist within the theaters of operation that we are conducting on. Uh, activities in. Uh, and in that role, uh, I've deployed to the Ukraine uh, it, prior to the current invasion in 2014. Uh, and there I was working with Ukrainian Armed Forces, working on hybrid warfare and the role of civil society and how to coordinate uh, and ensure actors are protected in that space. Uh, I then also deployed in Nepal for the initial earthquake there uh, and worked very closely there with OCHA and other humanitarians, especially with the cluster system, which was uh, very eye-opening for me at the time. Uh, then I've deployed to Poland for the humanitarian response. Uh, I arrived somewhat after the initial influx of uh, Ukrainians uh, and really worked on trying to set the condition for a possible second massive wave should the situation in Ukraine deteriorate massively. So, uh, you know, change of tactics like use of WNDs or something like that we saw as a trigger for another wave. And then most recently, I was in Mali uh, as the Deputy Chief of Information Operations with MINUSMA. Uh, They're working closely with uh, the CIMIC within the UN, as well as OCHA and other uh, government agencies and civilian actors uh, within that space. Uh, 
And now I'm back in Canada. I'm currently uh, sitting here in Kingston, Ontario. Wow. Okay. Thanks. And we'll come back to that eye-opening um, uh, observation you had as well from Ukraine. Okay. So to uh, you now, uh, Thayer, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I, um, I work right now with the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiations. And um, my current job is focusing on helping humanitarian workers um, and planning and executing their negotiations to help the people. And um, how did I arrive to this point is basically I worked many years in protection of civilian sector, um, focused on Syrian response, um, Lebanon, Iraq, South Sudan. And I moved uh, also to, to Yemen, um, where I worked with the protection cluster for a couple of years. And from there, I wanted to focus more on access, negotiations, and engagement, um, and diplomacy. Um, and, and why? Just because there was no day we will have in Yemen without negotiating access, negotiating services, trying to build trust, try to build relationships. Um, and it wasn't easy all the time. And I think that opened my eyes actually into this whole world of there is no way we can help the people without knowing how to engage with the duty bearers, with the military, with the security, with the people in power um, overall. So my focus mainly from moved from protection operations programming into now really working on research, working on community of practice of people who try to negotiate, try to learn from them and help others do it, to do it maybe more effectively. Mm. Well, great, great. Thank you, uh, Thayer. And I think you've already hit on some of the most crucial elements of building trust and building these relationships with often difficult uh, stakeholders, um, whether they be uh, an armed group that is denying us access, as you've alluded to, or or potential local authorities, or sometimes even within our own organizations um, themselves, we might face some blockers. So I think let's start with you again, Stu. And I think, could you talk us through the process you use as a military practitioner before you approach any actor that you wish to influence? Absolutely. Uh, I can talk her through a process. And I think the one of the first things I'll do is I'll break it into two different uh, kind of lanes. We have a, a deliberate process, which is where we know what we're going to do. We have time in advance uh, and a dynamic, which is really kind of uh, shooting from the hip and, and dynamically engaging in a much shorter time frame. So within the deliberate process, I have like planning horizons. I can allocate resources uh, prior to going in. Uh, and this is where we're going to really emphasize analysis. And so doing that uh, kind of whole of system look, uh, really pull back before we go in. Uh, we spend a lot of time determining what it is we're trying to dis get out of the engagement. Uh, and so we often end up in this trap where we engage with people because we've been told to. So like, go meet with this leader and we off we go. And that leader isn't necessarily the right person to actually achieve the change we want. Uh, and so we do a lot of time in analyzing who we're going to engage with and, and why. And then what is the exact behavior change or desired outcome? Again, that, that identifying the end state, so what we want to achieve at the end, is very important because that we will reverse engineer uh, to determine who and when. And so that time spent in analysis is almost never wasted. And we have, as a military, we have a bit of an advantage. We often have quite a lot of analysis going in prior to even entering the theater of operation, just taking advantage of you know the whole of government and its resources in that front. And then the other kind of lane is that dynamic. And this is a much more hasty process. It usually follows the exact same steps, so some like identifying what the overall objective is, uh, what the behavior change is, who the best people are to do that. But we'll we'll conduct that very quickly. And so I've done that, you know, in the car driving to a meeting. I'm still going through this process. We have a nice little uh, cheat sheet uh, that we use. The army loves what we call a memoirs or or performas, where we fill these things on laminated paper. Uh, and but that's a very useful tool just to take that time, no matter how rushed we are, to just take that one step and do a bit of a deliberate thought of what we're going to do, what we're trying to achieve. Um, and in that plan, so we've identified kind of what we want to do and why, and then we will always kind of outline our rough argument. And then it both deliberate and dynamic, we'll always emphasize having an exit strategy success, exit strategy uh, kind of failure. And so when we achieve our change, how can we cement it? You know, are we taking a photo? Are we doing a public statement? 
Uh, are we getting something in writing? Are we setting up for follow-on meetings to reinforce the change? And then if we have the meeting goes badly, so if I you know, completely offend the stakeholder, how do I set the meeting or set the conditions for someone else to engage? Or maybe after a cool down period, I can come back. Uh, but I always want to leave with the ability for someone, whether it's myself or someone else from the organization I'm working with, to be able to follow up with that stakeholder and, and make sure I don't burn a bridge, essentially, and that, that no matter how narrow that bridge gets, we always have that ability to go back. And, and can I ask you, Stu, based on that, the two different processes, you've put a lot of emphasis on analysis first, um, understanding what the outcome is that you want, the objective, and then having a plan A for everything going well, where you're building the relationship, and a plan B for if the meeting has gone bad, who might follow up in the, uh, in the next or future meetings. How much time on average do you devote to analysis and preparation versus how much time is spent in actual advocacy? So I, I would say in terms of on the planning side, I'd say about two thirds are spent in analysis and what we would call mission analysis is the military term for this, but really identifying what it is we're trying to achieve and why and, and the various factors that will affect it. And then another third planning it. And in the military, we might spend hundreds of hours planning and zero time executing. We do a lot of plans that never happen. Uh, but by and large, I would, I would probably throw it somewhere in the spectrum of a nine to one, you know, planning, preparation, rehearsals versus actual execution. There's a, a common expression, in, especially in the infantry, of hurry up and wait, which is we do all this effort to get ready and then we just kind of sit and wait. Uh, and I think that's one advantage the military has over the kind of civilian and humanitarian cluster is... Uh, usually time and, uh, and people. So we have a little bit more time for that preparation and we have a team that often is supporting this. So when I work with, in the CIMIC environment, I'm usually part of a two to three person team doing that. And we'll, we'll kind of break out these tasks, which is another uh, kind of unique aspect of military planning is it tends to be very collaborative and we have assigned drills and practices on how to do that collaboratively. Okay, that's great. So you have the assigned drills and practices, you have a dedicated uh, time and structures and tools for doing the analysis. And, and are there other things that you believe like humanitarians should take into consideration when engaging stakeholders on protection advocacy, the good practices from the military side that you, you might also want to add? That's a good question. I think the, probably the, the biggest one is, is taking that time to really identify what the outcome of the meeting is. I've had quite a few meetings with humanitarians where at the end of it, we had a great meeting, we discussed lots of things, but I didn't have any concrete outcomes. So there was kind of vague discussion about intents and like good practices, but there wasn't like, okay, as of this day at this time, we will now do this. And so I think, again, kind of really locking down what the, the concrete behavior change you want is and as, assigning a timeline to that. And I think there's some, that, that's probably been my biggest friction point or frustration with, with engaging with humanitarians is we all kind of agree, like something should change, something should happen, but we don't then have like an, what I would consider an actionable plan. And, and again, the, the more you come to the table, if you have a plan that can then be steered and corrected, I find that more effective. I, the, the term I use is throwing spaghetti at a wall. You know, if you're not sure what's cooked and you just throw it all at the wall, then the chefs can go in and decide what's good and what's not. Uh, but if you show up with nothing and the intent is to plan in that meeting, you're probably going to need a very long meeting or lots of meetings. And so, uh, yeah, that was, that was probably my, my two biggest tips is make sure you, you have discernible, concrete outcomes and two, better to show up with a plan that can be changed than the intent to have a plan. That makes perfect sense to me, having sat through multiple of those types of meetings that you've just described. So I know exactly where you're coming from. And I think that's a good opportunity now uh, to talk to uh, you again, uh, Thayer, and, and ask you, uh, based on your experience, um, and you've already alluded to the situation in Yemen, but what has been the most challenging when trying to engage stakeholders around protection issues? Yeah, no, thank you again. Um, I would say I can recall three main challenges I personally faced, but we also hear a lot from those who try to advocate or engage with uh, military or security personnel. Um, the first one is if we protection by nature 
it's inherently sometimes a concept that can bring non-tangible outcomes into the conversation. And I, I have seen it a lot where protection trying to advocate, but they keep it at the very, you know, the very value-based conversation that exactly what Stuart mentioned, that where is the, where is the action? Where is the, uh, what is the outcome that I can do something about it as military uh, uh, personnel? And I have seen that. And I think part of it, because when we say protection about protecting rights of people, improving the civilians' safety, sometimes it doesn't translate to very practical actions. And I think that was one challenge about it um, and how we move from being very theoretical, from being very, you know, uh, principle based into having, I would say, a more practical language in our engagement. Um, it is difficult as a challenge for me because protection is sometimes all about trying to preserve the dignity of a person, try to find the right words might be a bit harder. The second one is really about in where, where I worked. Uh, my main focus is really Middle East, uh, and right now also Afghanistan and Myanmar. In many of these contexts, protection is a sensitive topic. Protection, the moment you mention the word, you mention you have to talk about a little bit violations that are happening. And, and that's not something all these duty bearers or military or security personnel want to hear. They want to hear about, you know, the food you want to distribute, um, the shelter units you want to build, uh, how many water points you want to, you know, you want to construct. The moment you start to talk about the rights for women, the, the, the spaces for girls and boys to talk and try to avoid recruiting those who are underage, it becomes a bit uncomfortable conversation. And the third one, I think it's, um, I think it's really related to probably... The humanitarians do it the opposite of what Stewart mentioned. We execute nine and we might plan one <laughs> to one, like in terms of, of how we do it. And part of what we are really trying to do, uh, like in my work, is to create a space for people to come together to reflect over a few days on how to plan. We spend three days with them, one, one of the modules that we try to do, spend three days to take them through steps of planning a meeting planning that negotiation, that engagement. They sometimes might have to advocate. And we really discover that a lot of people we work with right now, they don't have that space on their daily work. Sometimes we understand why, because they really run from one fire to another to put it down. But sometimes I think it's an attitude, it's a mentality that we think as a humanitarian ourselves, we think that we're more entitled to respond right now and then fix things later when we do our quarterly review to look back what we did. It's taking a little bit of time for people to start thinking that you have to plan, even if it's a car ride, for 10 minutes to meet your commander counterpart, you still have 10 minutes and you can do something Got it. And can I ask, uh, based on that, Thayer, you have mentioned a number, a number of things. One is bringing up the difficult issues that the duty bearers of state or an armed actor or government may not wish to hear. And the other part is the in-depth planning and preparation that would be more institutionalized, as we've heard from, from Stu, in, in a military um, operational perspective, whereas a humanitarian uh, is more inclined to be responsive or uh, reactive rather than um, finding that space. So when, when you were in that situation and you saw that the humanitarians are rushing, rushing around, um, how did you prepare or how did you um, create that space, let's say, for um, those difficult and challenging uh, stakeholder engagements. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I tried different things. Some of them work, some of them don't. And also, we really need a disclaimer here that not all the useful tips will work with everyone. Um, and we work, especially when also there's a difference between organized military and non-state armed groups, for example. There's few rules that can apply a little bit differently. Um, but I have to say what really work with everyone is keep the respect even if you disagree. And why I'm mentioning this when we talk about planning is for me, 
that will give you the breathing space to plan for next time. If this meeting is going to end with high tension, with, uh, with absolute disagreement, that's fine. It happens. We come from very different worlds sometimes as humanitarians and military, but never, ever break the respect. Keep that respect because that will give you the space to listen, to engage. And once you listen, you know where they are coming from. And once you hear that, you can plan better next time. And that's for me the message that we really keep trying to, to push. So for me, the best way to plan, the best way to have a good second meeting is you need the first meeting to pass. Go there, listen, keep the respect, engage, write down everything they say, check things if they are not clear to you, ask them why when they say no, why is it important for them to say no? Try to understand where they are coming from. Now, unfortunately, it's not always reciprocal. As a humanitarian worker, you might do that, but you have sometimes military or security personnel, they might have their own way of working, of course, their own values that they follow, their own ethos that they navigate through. So you might not get that. Never leave the Never, I would say, abandon your patience in a way because there is no way around it. If they are the duty bearer, as a humanitarian, at the core of the whole humanitarian work, we are mostly invited technically and legally into a context, into a disaster. There is no better way than building trust, building relationship, plan, plan. And then if you fail, it's fine, but then try again and be better. Okay, so there's a number of important things there, Tyre, that I think are very interesting that you've said. One is this um, emphasis on respect despite the interlocutor that you're going to be speaking to and don't expect the respect in return, let's say. And also as well, to not put the priority issue that you want to bring to the table at in the first meeting, right? That we're building this relationship, this trust, developing that from not from over a period of time, better said. And I think that's that's quite interesting. And if we were to consider where we have Stu on the one side coming from a, a military operational perspective and you now coming from the research, but with the humanitarian uh, practical perspective, is there something that you have observed around engaging with uh, military and we can go from like state uh, state in uh, military actors to non-state armed groups, which is a, a different kettle of fish, as you very rightly pointed out. Is there specific challenges there that you think uh, humanitarians could work on or um, approach slightly differently? Yeah, I, I think something I really realize personally and also talking to others is I think these two spheres or these two words come in contact mostly when there's a crisis. I think we have, we have an issue here we are dealing with, that these two words talk to each other when only there's a problem. It's like you're having a cousin who only call you because they need money from you and they never talk to you the rest of the year. And I think that's affecting the trust, the mutual trust that can be built. I think as the the humanitarian sector need to invest more to find spaces for these two words and spheres to interact safely and be able to open, speak, raise their concerns. And not when only there is a hundred trucks waiting to cross a checkpoint. And now when, when the emotions are up, the tension is really high. The stakes are extremely high. Now we need to build the relationship. I think that's something we really need to reflect on. And maybe I would also like to hear from Stuart what he think about that is how can we have those conversations when we don't have the tension, the emotions are high. So when we have a crisis, oh, wait a minute, I remember Stuart and he remembered Thayer. There's something here can break the ice and we can have a conversation. Yeah, and I think that's a good point to, to bring you back in, uh, Stu. Um, so having heard from, from there, having seen that we tend to show up when there's a crisis or a serious issue and the tensions have emerged, this is when we're starting to look towards 
uh, military actors for potential solutions. Or in some cases, we're looking and pointing fingers, which is also not very helpful. So from your perspective, you've already mentioned coming into a meeting with, um, with, uh, without a clear plan or objective that you want to achieve and not going away with any actionable um, uh, recommendations or things that we should take forward. What other common mistakes have you seen humanitarians do in engaging with the military and, and what advice could you give to them? Yeah, I think I think so. All excellent points were just made. And I think my version of like maintaining that bridge is, is the equivalent of this maintaining respect. Right. And I think those are that's a very important point to engage. I also kind of wanted to, to loop back into that. We talked about protection and it, it's a loaded term and it often can be confusing. And I think that's a that's another uh, that's a very important thing to remember is humanitarians have built their own language, especially within kind of the UN legal f- kind of uh, high level talk. It, there's very specific words that mean very specific things to people in that world. But when you talk about protection to a soldier, that usually directly equates to like physical uh, protection, right? So when you say, hey, we need to help protect this village to a, most military minds, that means putting soldiers in around it uh, or something like that. And often the humanitarian side is the exact opposite goal. They, they don't want people with guns anywhere near the village. And so this is like a, a, a confusion. And so in Mali, I saw that repeated over and over again with the, the Mali government, the junta, looking for the UN peacekeepers to play a larger and larger role in protection because they kept saying that's part of your mandate. But they were really talking about physical protection of people and less, uh, you know, the structural and societal changes and the empowering of women voices and building a society and the other uh, tiers of of civil protection. And so I think understanding some of the loaded terms that are being used and being very aware of them. And it, it, the, the reverse is true of the military. We tend to use a lot of military jargon and just assume everyone in the room understands what we're saying. And that's often not always the case. I also think uh, Thayer's point about maybe needing multiple engagements is a really good one. So I kind of talked about making sure you have a plan for the meeting. But in many cultures, if you try and have concrete outcomes in the first meeting, it's offensive or it's not going to be successful. And so I think, again, when you go back to that analysis, understanding the culture that you are operating in and, and how that changes. So when I'm making my plan is, is the first meeting just ice breaking, just relationship building, just trust breaking or trust building. And that's, I can approach that meeting very, very differently. I'll, you know, I'll schedule if I can all the time in the world. So no one feels rushed. No one feels pressure. Whereas if I have concrete outcomes that I need in a concrete time frame, I'll have to approach it a bit differently. I would say from a Western military perspective, we like as few meetings as possible and, and we kind of operate in a high trust environment That's and we achieve that uh, by doing combined exercises a lot. So NATO runs NATO level exercises where numerous countries get together uh, and work together with their militaries, which from a historical perspective is very novel <laughs> uh, and it, it's kind of a unique aspect. And I think Thayer's point about finding opportunities like this, like this podcast we're doing right now, to get military and humanitarian and advocacy groups together to work, uh, discuss, share ideas, I think is key. I've been very uh, fortunate in my career to be involved with like UN OCHA's CivMil program, as well as the World Food Program's Humanitarian Military Interactions program. And I think those are really good initiatives to help bridge these gaps where we have military and civilian practitioners learning together and approaching things together. And I think, I think that is probably one of the number one things I would advise any humanitarian is to find opportunities to, to work with militaries uh, as available outside of crisis or conflict. Because he Thayer's point is absolutely bang on. In the crisis, temperatures are high. Uh, people's willingness to take criticism and stuff is is diminished. Whereas to learn in a learning environment when there's no consequences is, is much better. So the more opportunities we take, the better to be in discussions and also just building this uh, relationship with one another, as well as understanding what our loaded terms are. So out of curiosity, uh, Stu, what is our understanding of protection in military jargon? If we're looking at, um, we're talking about a particular village, as you've said, we don't necessarily want more armed actors in that village. We want people to feel safe and secure. Um, how do you approach that kind of conversation with, with the military without confusing them? 
Yeah. So I think whenever engaging, and I, I can really only speak from Western military, I would be uh, essentially guessing from other military perspectives, but from a Western military perspective, I think it's really important to understand what our mission and purpose is going in. Uh, and so if I use uh, Mali as an example in the UN peacekeeping mission, our mandate is freely available. So when you're engaging with the UN military forces, you can see what their objectives are, what their assigned tasks are. And then I think communicating to them in, in those kind of more concrete uh, avenues. So if we're talking about uh, protection, the military default is always going to assume that I think it's the first tier of, or third tier, I can't remember, sorry, but of, of physical protection. Like that, that's, that's what we're going to assume. And to be honest, that's mostly what military forces are probably focused on within the tiered protection framework. Uh, is that physical? But when we now talk about how do you, military forces always want to keep resources available to do the unforeseen uh, event. And so one of the best uh, avenues of approach with military actors is to communicate how doing X will free up resources for them to do something later or do something different. And so how can uh, installing lights in a town reduce the physical a number of soldiers and amount the need for a number of patrols for their soldiers, therefore reducing their burden. So how can we make physical structural interventions and what is the positive impact on that in terms of labor and resources? Like the, and so commanders essentially are want to always keep everything in the bank account and not spending in the market when they think about troops and resources. And I think that is a good approach is, is communicating how those other more abstract uh, frameworks and protection directly lead to even if it's in a year, two years, three years, how do those lead to a reduced reliance on physical military presence? I just, I just wanted to one more point, which I think, uh, I think there is kind of touched on it, but we have an expression which is never promise anything. And, and so, you know, whatever you're agreeing on, you always kind of end with, okay, I'm going to take this back. I'm going to see what I can do. But if, if, and, and if we have talked about physical actions, we always want to make leave with a clear understanding of what the expectations are because expectation management is what will often break trust where you've had a meeting you've left understanding that you're going to go and do a but they're of the understanding that you're going to do a b c d e f uh, and then when you only do a they then you've broken that trust and so we we have a, a it's it's kind of drilled into us never promise always always leave with the listen i'm going to see how much i can do this my intent is to do this but I want to make sure you understand that I can't guarantee anything. Uh, and that's especially that I think that's a very, very important in dynamic environments where you might be 100 percent, even if it's as simple as I'm going to meet you tomorrow or in one hour, I'm going to come back and we can follow up. And then who knows what happens? Your car breaks down and then you don't make it. So always make it like, listen, I'm going to plan to be back in an hour, uh, you know, and always kind of set those conditions because you want to really ma expectation management, I think, is very, a very important concept in, in building trust. Okay, and that's a great insight there, Stu. I haven't thought about it that way myself, but I'm certainly going to use that one from now on. Um, I think it's it's really good. Also, as well, that fact that if we're if we're coming with with loaded terms, we're already putting people on edge, particularly if we haven't invested the time in um, in building the relationship between between ourselves and each other. So, um, it's a very interesting insight to have. How can we influence um, some of the other actors that we will come across in a humanitarian context. And with that, I think it would be interesting, um, uh, Thayer, to come back to you and your experience as a, a trainer on access negotiations. So given all that you've, you've heard and discussed so far, are there particular practical other tips that you are providing your students with when they're approaching difficult negotiations? Yeah, I think um, one thing we keep the emphasis uh, on is basically never never have an action or respond or react right after the first response you get. What I mean by that, you will hear first a no. A soldier will tell you, no, there's no way you can cross this checkpoint. If you take this, you go back, then we never distribute any food. What we try really to push for is try to push two more layers. First layer after the first one, which is the position, try to understand the reasoning. How did this person, this military, the security personnel come up with the no or the yes? What is the reasoning? What is the logic that they adopted? Try to understand that, have that conversation. 
And that's also sometimes not enough. So we really try to push them to try to understand a third layer, which is the motives, the values, the principles, sometimes the identity in some context. Those are the drivers of every word we hear in an access or a negotiation situation. If they say no or yes, there is something hidden. Like a very, a one case I, I use a lot from Iraq when we had to negotiate with the commander not to send, uh, you know, uh, 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 armed cars with us, not to send, uh, not to, to accompany us to a civilian camp with two cars of 10 soldiers. And there was no, it's for your safety, you know, it's for your safety. At one point we believed it, but when we digged a little bit more, we discovered a whole more things into that. Those soldiers are not paid for, for, for a long period of time. The only way that they can be paid is to give them a job. Hence, you have 10 people with, with big guns uh, trying to accompany civilian cars going into civilian uh, camp. And the moment we understand that, we were able to have a conversation about it. It's like, it's not the way, this is not a source of income, but we understand that this is a concern. At the end of the day, these soldiers were not paid. And a little bit of work to understand where they are coming from, link them maybe to other programs through a completely different sector, maybe development, maybe some project that the government already has, might help a little bit. But there was... No way you can solve a situation like that if we remain stuck at the position level. It's yes, it's a no, and these two levels are usually the opposite. It's, there is nothing could be more opposite than a yes and a no. But when you go a little bit deeper to understand the values, we might be able to connect. And that's, I think, something we try to promote. That at the end of the day, a military, a security, civilian body, or a person, look at them as a person as a human being and we might find things that we might connect with that might sound like okay well very nice very romantic and it works all the time definitely not there's so many situations it doesn't work and um, i like what Stuart mentioned uh, about uh, trust and i would say just a few words on that because that's that's a important and yet a very complex concept huh? the concept of trust to build between humanitarians and military we shouldn't forget that trust can be based on the person, on the process, and on the organization. So if, from a Western military, they themselves might trust the process. They trust the hierarchy. They trust that they are going somewhere with all that planning. They trust the orders. What I have seen in the Middle East, we have to go beyond that. We have to build the trust at the personal level, at that one single soldier that is blocking my work and try to connect with this person. Because the process sometimes within their own hierarchy might fail them. It's not the same. This is not the same organizations we are talking about from a Western military or not. It might be different and we have to account for those differences in our engagement. Mm, thank you, Thayer. And I think that's possibly the, the key point. And I've heard this repeated in other forum as well about building trust and understanding the perspective of the person that we're trying to influence. So I, I guess I'd like to ask both of you now, having listened to, to each other, there's a couple of questions I think that jump out. Is there anything that Stu has mentioned uh, that has sparked some new ideas for you, Thayer, or vice versa, Stu? And also as well, where do you see the opportunities for more collaboration when we are out in a humanitarian crisis together. In some, um, you've talked a little bit already about the need to start building those bridges from the very beginning, and there are some structures that are, that are set up that allows us to do that. But are there other things that we should be considering that can help us to collaborate in a way where we're both looking through a different lens, but to achieve the same result, which is to reduce the risk of violence and coercion and deprivation for a population or community. So any last kind of observations or things that have jumped out at you that you'd like to share? Uh, I, I think the air's latest uh, point about uh, really identifying the root causes. So I think we, we, we use a lot of interest-based negotiations as, as, a, as a technique in, uh, that we teach here in Canada to our 
uh, civil military cooperation uh, soldiers. And I think that's key, right? And I think he even used the term pyramid. And that's I have a slide somewhere here with, uh, with the triangle on it. And I, I think the key there is getting to somewhere where you both say yes to something and then building back from there. Uh, and so starting at the start point, I think is key, but then going all the way to the bottom. And then within the military, I would again just emphasize identifying that you're talking to the right person. So in most cases, the soldier sitting at the front with the rifle actually has very little power within that organization. Uh, he's probably got a boss or a general or a colonel that who really has that authority, and he might not know the reason. He's just been given orders, don't let people pass. And so again, t- taking that time in the beginning to be like, okay, you said no. Oh, it's because you were ordered to. Okay, is there someone else I can talk to? And I think, I think I've learned that that's, that's also true on the humanitarian side, is that there's this assumption that, you know, I talk to this cloud. So there's a node that comes out of this cloud. It's a person. They say things. They go back into this cloud. And, and then everything is supposed to happen. And really identifying, well, actually, no, like, you know, humanitarians also have, uh, whether it's uh, donors that need to be consulted or just their own hierarchy, and that that can take some time. Um, but I think my main takeaway coming from all of this is for the most part, we're teaching the same thing to two different groups. So much of what they are is talking about talking, training his, uh, access teams is, is very, very similar content to, to what we are looking at. And, and by and large, again, I'm very privileged to work in the Canadian military where we do have the same overall objective, which is to reduce, uh, civilian harm. We take, we go about those uh, goals very different ways, usually in terms of physical actions, but we share that going back to that bottom of that, that pyramid. I think we do by and large share those objectives uh, most times. And I think, you know, building that alliance, that, that group of stakeholders that all have similar objectives and then identifying those that need to be brought on board, I think is a really good approach for the future. And so again, thank you for this opportunity because I think these types of things are absolutely essential for improving this going forward. Mm, thank you, Stu. And there, any last famous last words from you that you want to add? Yeah, so, so Thayer made a really good point about uh, kind of loaded terms. So he, he his example was on the term protection. And I think it's really important when we have these discussions to make sure everyone in the room is understanding what is meant with some of these words, especially when we're working across language barriers. Because from a, from a military perspective, protection defaults to us to physical protection. So if we talk about protect, if we're trying to build a protection of of civilians in a village, for instance, a military commander is going to think that means soldiers in the town to make sure that nothing bad happens. Whereas often from the, from the protection side, your goal is the opposite. You want to get the weapons and the soldiers as far away from the civilians as possible. And so really identifying and understanding the terms that were being used uh, as more and more of these terms become kind of academicized, where there's PhDs being written on some of these terms. And a lot of people have this assumed understanding of what the term means. It doesn't necessarily translate. I really think we need to to have more spaces where these two spheres interact more safely. Um, just something of like, I remember we ran a session with also ex-military who try, was trying to explain the hierarchy, the concepts, like to the ranks within military. And, and then we, we found that a lot of humanitarians don't even know the ranks, like who you will talk to, who is more senior, you know, and if someone tells you it's beyond my hands, what do you do next? Who do you go to? And I think we need more of those spaces and because it is a learning curve for humanitarians and for a lot of the military who also can be assigned and be liaising with the humanitarian in crisis and disaster. We need more of that before, as I mentioned earlier, before the disaster, just to understand each other, understand where those language come from, where do we come from. Well, this has been a really um, interesting and informative conversation, and I really appreciate both of you taking the time to talk to us today. And I think one of the key things that I want to take away, as everybody will say about ad advocacy and protection is it is definitely more art than science, but there is a process and there is a structure and there is some thinking and some serious thinking that can go in to any engagement that we have with people. And we want to start building that trust, that relationship, that um, sense of empathy and understanding what their position is from day one. So thank you very much for today, I found it really informative. I hope you did too. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Advocating for Protection podcast. 
It's produced by the Global Protection Clusters Advocacy Working Group, which is co-led by Save the Children in Oxfam and includes members from national and international NGOs and UN agencies. You can find out more information about the Advocacy Working Group on globalprotectioncluster.org. Look out for the Protection Advocacy Toolkit whilst on this website. And if you have feedback or suggestions for future episodes, email us at protectionteam at oxfam.org.